Um, so why am I here? I guess I'm here to encourage you all to start a business. Uh, I was your age, uh, it seems to me, not so long ago. To you, it probably seems forever. Uh, but, it, but, but very recently, uh, I was in your shoes and decided that uh, when I was a junior uh, at Berkeley that I want to start a company. And so I, I've really spent my whole life in entrepreneurship. As Dean uh, Bella talked about, I, I, I'm an engineer uh, by background. I never actually worked as an engineer. Um, I have a degree in economics as well. Never worked as an economist, however. Uh, I took a class when I was a junior um, that was about starting a company. The word entrepreneurship really wasn't, you know, the word it is today. But back in the, in the when was it? It was in the late 80s when I graduated. Uh, there was one class at Berkeley about being an entrepreneur. And I took that class. It was from the founders of Sun, which was obviously a very successful company. It was not a very successful company at the time. It was a startup at the time. Um, but, it, but it kind of turned me on to the whole entrepreneurship and startup ecosystem. So, uh, so just to round out my story, I, I, I did graduate uh, eventually, um, five years with the, three degree, with the two degrees. And then I went to work as a startup in uh, Silicon Valley as a coder. I knew nothing about coding. Um, I was a mechanical engineer, I was an economist. I was all my all my all the colleagues in the school were all applying to Bain and were applying to Wall Street, and I just wanted to work for a startup. So I went. To, so I had to go find it myself. They don't recruit at schools like this. Uh, they don't recruit at any school. Startups can't recruit. Uh, so you got to go find them. And I found one in the East Bay in California, um, and went to work for him for two years. Learned a ton of stuff from him. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I literally just started day one. He said, okay, you're going to be a systems analyst. I didn't know what that meant. And you just started coding. We were building applications for industrial systems. It was an interesting experience. Um, lots of things did not come to fruition uh, that I now, know, I now know about, options and all that kind of thing. Um, but it was a great experience. So then I decided that at the ripe age of, how old was I? I was about 25, I guess. Um, I was already married. I got married right out of school as a child. Um, my wife was finishing her degree. And we decided that we would move, that I could, st I could start a company. And that's what we did. Uh, we actually, I, I'm a fourth generation Californian. Uh, I decided that I wanted to live somewhere else. Um, and so for me, the east shore of Lake Tahoe was really the east coast. And so I thought, well, we'll go beyond that and we'll go somewhere else. And so we ended up in Pennsylvania. Um, and we're in a place where the economy was changing from an industrial economy to a clean economy. And I thought, well, you know, there's lots of people here. There's two, co three colleges. I can hire undergraduate talent. I can get cheap labor. And we'll start a company. And that's what I did. I gave it not much more thought than that. Um, I'm not a very creative person, um, but I can execute on things. And so I figured that if I just started this company, hung out a shingle, people would come to us. And they effectively did. Um, we ended up, uh, and I'll talk about this a little bit later in the talk, but I ended up um, answering the phone one day, which changed my life. And it was really just a lucky phone call, and I just happened to answer it. Um, but I'll talk about being lucky and being an entrepreneur in a second. So anyway, so that company um, ended up writing all Federal Express's international shipping software. So this is back way before you were born. Um, but before the internet was the internet, one of the most valuable applications on the web was at, web, uh, at, at FedEx.com where you could type in a tracking number and it would tell you where that package was. That was our software. Uh, nobody knew that, and if you called 1-800-GO-FEDEX, we answered the phone. Nobody knew that as well. But it was as a result of one lucky phone call. I ended up selling that company. Is this getting louder or is it just me? Um, it, um, I ended up selling that company in what year? In um, 1996, I sold it to a private, a, group, a private equity group, which is private money. Um, they ran into the ground. And, don't tweet that. And, um, <laughs> But it was after my payout, so I was fine. So I took a couple of years off. I went to business school um, just really as a break. It really wasn't, I really didn't have any great master plan. I was already 32 or something like that. So I was really old. Uh, I was married. We had a child by then. Um, and, and I just wanted to go to business school and have a break, take a break. And it was a great experience, and it changed my life. And it changed my life in the terms of the contacts that I made. I'd always sort of... Um, I, I, my sister went to a private boarding school and went on to great things, and I never, I was wondering if that was kind of a waste of money for her to do that. But what I realized when you go to a private school and you go to all these great fancy schools is that the network you get, and again, I'll come back to this, because I think that's one of the most fundamental things you can do today, is to network. Um, so after business school, I um, was going to move back to California. Um, this was, what, 1999. I shipped all my stuff back to California, and I got persuaded um, to take this job in Baltimore, a place where I didn't actually want to live. And I was told that this guy, the guy I would work for, was a super all-general venture capitalist. I didn't know what a venture capitalist did. Uh, he was an all-around general venture capitalist. He was a Rhodes Scholar, Harvard undergrad, great guy. And he let me do whatever I wanted. Well, that sounded pretty good. And we had an unlimited balance sheet with Deutsche Bank. Well, that sounded even better. So, uh, so that's what I did. And that was ABS Ventures. And so we were the, we were the, the early-stage venture arm of effectively Deutsche Bank. 
which is a big bank, as you all know. We, we were bought by Deutsche Bank originally, and then the bubble crashed, bubble one happened. I had moved down here, um, and by then we had two kids, and I moved down here, and I'd opened up this really fancy office in Tyson's Corner, bubble one crashed, and we closed that office about 20 minutes later. And so I went into DC and worked there for a while at Deutsche Bank. It was kind of a, kind of a boring job, frankly. I'm not a big company guy. Um, I didn't last, I didn't really like it, didn't really just sit there and sell. We sold off about eight and a half billion dollars worth of assets. Um, so we formed a new venture firm with my partner from ABS, and that became Blacksmith, which was really in a tough time to raise money. I'll talk about what a venture capitalist does here in a second, um, but it was a tough time to raise money. We only ra we raised less than $10 million, um, but we did 10 deals, and the last four deals we did, we did with another venture capitalist from another firm, and the last deal we did was automatic. I don't know if any of you are bloggers, but you probably use WordPress. Some of you may use WordPress. We power about 28% of the web. That was our 10th deal we did in this tiny fund, and we're still involved in it. Um, so we were able to go then change and raise a new fund called True, which is what Nina Bella talked about. Um, and we've raised, um, I was gonna say about, but we've raised exactly $680 million. Uh, and that fund today is about, well, I can't say that publicly, never mind. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so we had True, so we're, we're on our third fund. Um, we are an early stage venture capital firm based out in California, um, and I've been with them since the founding, obviously. One of the other things I wanted to mention, though, along the way was I got connected up with, and I'll talk about this guy again, Steve Blank, later on, but I got connected up with Steve Blank and the National Science Foundation. And again, this just goes back to connections. Uh, we took, uh, we took, what did we take? We took 92 full professors, generally, from research institutions around the country. And these are people who look at their shoes when they walk. I mean, these are serious, hardcore scientists that just don't look up. And we took them, and we got them to get out of the lab and actually form a company and raise money. And it was a tremendously successful program that we did. We taught it at Stanford. We taught it at Stanford twice. It's now taught all over a lot of research institutes around the country. But it really goes to show that if you actually have a, have a curriculum, you have a way of thinking, you have a framework to deal with, that anybody, really, sorry, I'm ignoring all you guys over here, uh, anybody can really go out and start a company. And, that, and that's what the i really was. So Michael Novak, uh, I, don't, I don't quite know how in the world I ended up talking after Michael Novak, but evidently he was too philosophical, and I'm certainly not very philosophical, so I guess it'll be a good counterbalance. He said that we should start 200 million companies to raise a billion people out of poverty. I think that's what he said. That's what he said. And the only way to do that, obviously, is to start new companies. And new companies are really the only bright spot, if you think about it, in the U.S. economy today. The U.S. economy is kind of lagging, as we all know. Uh, and tech and new company formation is really the only bright spot. Uh, and a little bit of research, 40% of the U.S. GDP, so that's about $6 trillion, is by companies that were formed after 1980. Those are new companies. So 40% of the U.S. GDP are companies that were formed after 1980. That is, I think, a remarkable statistic. Uh, and I'll just give a little, little plug for VC, uh, that we back 21%, so the 21% of the GDP has all been VC-backed companies. So that's more recent than 1980, because VC did not exist in 1980. So when you, look at, when you look at new net job creation, so jobs you're all gonna get, most of those, 100%, 100% of, new, of net new jobs are companies that are less than five years old. Less than five years old, those are brand new companies. It's 100% of the net new job creation in, this, in the United States. So it, it just goes to, say, goes to show that it is the startups, and I use that word loosely because I don't really like it, but it is the new companies, new companies formed are where you're all gonna get your jobs. So what is the purpose of a business? I used to, I do a lot of business plan competitions and coaching and mentoring and all this kind of stuff, but what's the purpose of a business? I was gonna ask, what's the purpose of a business? Somebody raise their hand and shout it out. Right, it's to make a profit. Most people don't want to, well, he's in the class. I did, we did this example in the class with him. But most people are afraid to say that. Most people think that profit is a bad word. But there's no reason for a business to exist other than to make a profit. We talk about changing entrepreneurs' lives. We talk about creating, we've created, just a true, we've created something close to 10,000 jobs. We've done a lot of great things, but the purpose of those businesses is really to create a profit. And, and, and creating value for your shareholders is a true virtue. It is not something to be, I don't, want to, I don't want to make too much money. I don't want to, no, you have to make money in order, to, in order for your employees to buy meals. So that truly is a virtue and something that you need to think about. So it's creating wealth. What do VCs do? Does anybody know what a VC does? Shake hands, yes, no, yeah, somebody. So what VCs, what a venture capitalist does, what I've been doing for the last 14 years is raising money from pension funds, right, schools, states, 
uh, other people who collect money, um, big pots of money to invest in us, and then we invested in startups. These are not, and startups for us, we're only IT, we're the biggest hardware investor in the country, but we're only IT. Um, and most companies don't qualify, most businesses don't qualify for venture capital. Venture capital, we're looking for a 10x return. Um, we're looking for something that is going to produce huge outsized returns to return money to our investors, all right? So it would not, so barbershops and all that kind of stuff, it doesn't, for, for a venture capitalist, it just doesn't make any sense for us to do it. We've got to return $680 million to our investors before we make a penny. And the way VCs make money is we take a, we take a cut of the profit after that company is, after that money's been returned. So after $680 million has been returned to our investors, we'll make, we'll actually make money. So a lot of people ask me, so that's what venture capitalist does. We raise money from one pocket and we invest in, and we invest in companies. We invest in startups and we only do startups. So 68% of the companies we've done have been at formation. That's when the papers are filed. It's a brand new thing. We've invested in college dropouts. We've invested in high school kids. We've invested in, and you name it, we've invested in them. Actually, it, our portfolio actually probably trends very low. Um, I have one partner who said who's 48 and will not invest in anybody his age or older. But, so our portfolio probably trends down into the 20s, people your age. Um, so what do we look for? A lot of people are always surprised when we talk about what we look for. And again, don't, don't tweet this stuff out. What we look for, we call it the Mickey Mouse diagram. If you can imagine Mickey Mouse has two ears and a big face. Um, you're familiar with that, I hope. Um, so we think about, we, we think about uh, one ear would be the deal structure. One ear would be the market, and the, and the face is the people. And what that means to us is that the people, the biggest circle, are by far and away the most important. We have to be in love with the people. We have to be in love with the team. That's you folks. We've got to love whether you think. We've got to love the way you interact with your co-founders. If there's weird tension in the room, we don't do the deal. Um, if, there, if you've got something funky in your Facebook, LinkedIn, we don't do the deal. Um, so we've got, to love, we've got to love who you are and what you're doing and why you're doing it and believe in you. Um, and if we don't, we just won't do the deal. So the other two things are, the, are the, the deal structure and the market. So what's missing in that? The product's missing in that. And that's what everybody focuses on in, in when they pitch us. Everybody comes up and all they want to do is talk about the product. The product's interesting. But if we believe that we're investing you in you, the best person in the world to do something, you'll figure the product out. We're not product people. I mean, some of us may be, but we're not, we're not really product people. You're the, pe you're the product people. And if you invest, our theory is if you invest in the best people in the world to do something, they'll figure out the product. So, we want to, so, the, so, the, so the product's not on the circles, not on the Mickey Mouse face. Um, so it's the, it's the deal. It's the deal structure. And I'm not going to talk too much about that because that's kind of boring. But it's how that deal is structured. Very meaningful to you, however. So if you're going to start a company, come and talk to me because how you structure that deal to start out with, super important. Um, but the other one is the market. We want to be invested in a huge, growing market. Later on, I'm going to talk about deals we've done where there is no market, so, which is true venture capital. But that's the, way we, that's the way we evaluate deals. So what do we look for? We look for founders of movements. Um, so there are, there are new, so Matt Mullenweg, I've already used the example of WordPress. Um, so Matt Mullenweg, the founder of, of WordPress and Automatic, you know, he was a, I think he was 17 when we found him in, uh, in Houston, Texas. He was, uh, I think in college, I'm pretty sure, I may not be. Uh, but anyway, he was a kid. Uh, we just, he was just spectacularly brilliant, articulate, honest. Um, and we, he came out to, he, uh, he, he came out to San Francisco. He was great friends with two of my partners, Owen Malik and Tony Conrad. Um, and we brought him out as a 17 or 18 year old kid out of Houston. Um, and he started this blogging platform called Automatic, which is now obviously known as WordPress. Uh, but there was no blogging at the time. There was no market for blogging at the time. Um, and today they're a very, very large company. They're probably the largest uh, independent internet company in the, in the, in the world. Um, so that's, that was Matt. Uh, who else did I have down here? So uh, Fitbit. So who has a Fitbit? Anybody have a Fitbit? Oh, you must have a Fitbit. You guys have no Fitbits? I know they're in your bookstore. I looked. You guys have no Fitbits? So, oh, we have a Fitbit. Okay, thank you. Uh, so anyway, so James, so James Park was the founder of Fitbit. He was an uh, engineer out of Berkeley. He went to work for Microsoft for a little while. And we were doing this off, we were doing this off site up in uh, Stinson Beach, which is a beach uh, where I used to live in California. And, um, and he came by, this young guy in his early 20s, I would say, fairly awkward. Uh, don't tweet that. Uh, and, and he had this like weird prototype of this. You all know what a Fitbit is? Just, yeah, yeah. Okay, so he had a weird prototype of the original Fitbit. And he was, and, he, and, and what he talked about, he had this vision of, 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 of a big data of, for the body. 
and you know, we can encourage people to lose weight, we can encourage fitness, and, and we'll get people to log onto the web. It all sounded crazy to me, um, but, but he was so engaging, really, and he was so passionate about this that we did the deal. Uh, there have been lots of times where that deal was kind of um, maybe not going to go so well, so don't tweet that either. Um, but uh, we had lots of problems with sweat. We had lots of problems with, uh, with people falling in the water with them. Uh, we had lots of issues with the manufacturing. It was all made in China. We didn't know what we were doing. This guy never made a product in his life. He's over has factories in China making this thing. So there are lots of problems. Today, it's a huge company. It is truly the juggernaut in the quantified self world. Um, it's on every shelf and every, in, you know, CVS, Best Buy, all kinds of places. Um, so he was a founder of that movement. Now, wearable technology, we've all got some sort of wearable technology probably on us today. But he was the beginning of that movement. He was really the founder of that movement. Uh, 3D printing. Then we have a 3D printer. Yeah, a couple of yes and no's kind of. Well, uh, so Bree Prentice in New York. He is probably 20 mid 20s. Anybody know Bree? He's a fabulous guy. He is so far off the charts, though it makes your head spin. Um, we had his meeting. We had his pitch deal in New York, um, and uh, when he walked out of the room, I was just sort of I was speechless. Um, he was so passionate about 3D printing. Now back this was. Oh, how long ago is this? This was probably four or five years ago. Um, so he came up, he had the idea that, not the idea, but he had built the first user, uh, basically definable machine, an open source project, uh, to, ha to print things in three dimensions out of plastic, which, you know, you can print trinkets and toys, and I wasn't really clear there was a real business here. But, um, and I will say, I was, the, I was the naysayer on that. Don't tweet that. Uh, I was the naysayer on that deal. But we did it anyway. Everybody else loved it. Uh, and we sold it to Stratasys for lots of money. Um, we only owned a fair small, small part of it. But, but he was the beginning of the 3D printing movement. And today, they're printing out ears. They're printing out heart valves. They're printing out parts of cars on 3D printers that you can buy these things for four or 5,000 bucks. So it's a, the printers and print anything you want. So it is, it is truly, if you, were to, if, if you came up to me today and asked me, what should I do today? I would do something with 3D printing in your garage because you can, you can have a micro manufacturing firm in your garage, in your flat, in your dorm room, making something unique. It's an unbelievable, unbelievable industry uh, at the time which had, had no market. Uh, Chris Anderson. So anybody have a drone here? Does anybody have a, uh, one of the quad drones? Somebody must have a quad drone. Okay, because they're not really engaging here in my little stories. So, so, so quad drones, you've all seen, you saw Jeff Bezos hold up the, uh, the quad drone. He's going to do delivery of Amazon packages with one of our drones. So Chris Anderson, who was the editor of Wired, came to us and said, hey, I got this great company. I got this great idea. And it's sort of a company at the time. Uh, well, we're going to make drones that we can uh, do, have do anything. And they're you know, about the size of this podium, about that big. Uh, they're quad drones with three helicopter blades four helicopter blades, that means quad, um, and, uh, and it can follow you around, it can follow your kid to work, kid to school, it can do anything you want, it can take pictures of your neighbors in their yard, it can do all kinds of things, so there's lots of privacy issues, but, but, um, but he has found a market in agriculture, and so they've, the farmer, the, the farmers, the agricultural people, fly these things around and they can check uh, crop damage, they can check watering, they can check fertilizer on vast acreage and s instead of rolling an ATV or rolling, a, rolling another helicopter. So who knew that was going to happen? I certainly didn't. So that's what we're looking for. So we're looking for these people, really, that we call founders of movements, and those are just, those are just a few examples. Uh, the other thing, the other more generic thing we look for, um, has anybody read the book Blue Ocean, Red Ocean? All right, I'll take that as a no. Um, anyway, so uh, there are, if you define markets as blue oceans or red oceans, red oceans are bloodbaths where the sharks are feeding. So there's, there's, it's just a, there's, there's, no market, there's no market growth. Everybody's just fighting for share. But a blue ocean is where there is no, there are no competitors, where there is no, maybe now there's no market, uh, where you just don't know. Uh, and you can grow the entire market and everybody could pro in that early market, as an early entrant in that market, could probably win. It's a great book. You should really look at it. But there was a, but the story I'm telling here is about three guys. It's a company called Valence Cell down in North Carolina. Um, these aren't really founders of movements, but they were, they were in their, none of them were married, so they're probably in their late 20s, a little bit older than you. Uh, they all had, I think, PhDs. Uh, they were working over GE, building sensors to detect pathogens in government buildings in D.C. It's kind of boring. It was, you know, it's kind of a road thing for them to do this. They wanted to leave their job and start a company. So they, so they thought about this for about six months. They decided, you know, we got no kids, we got no family. This is a great time for us to do it. There's never going to be a better time for us to start this company. So they quit their jobs. They're, they're great uh, GE jobs. They rented an apartment in upstate New York where they all were. And they sat in a room, sat in this apartment, for three months trying to figure out a company to start. 
and all they did was throw out idea after idea. Now they're very, very smart. Throwing out idea after idea after idea. And they finally settled on putting, uh, since they were sensor guys, it kind of makes sense, putting sensors into earbuds. And so these are IR sensors typically that go into a uh, Bluetooth or, or a regular earbud that measure your, through your tympanic membrane uh, and this little knob thing on your ear, which I always forget what that thing's called. But anyway, through that thing. Um, and they can measure your heart rate, your blood oxygen level, blood saturation level, um, all kinds of things. And they can actually get a basal metabolic rate for you. The military uses it, the police use it, and you can buy them on the store today. But this was literally, this is what entrepreneurship is. It was sitting around thinking up ideas and creating something out of nothing. With I, I just really give them a lot of credit because they did quit great jobs and started this thing on a, on a whim. Uh, we've been involved with them now for, I don't know, four or five years. So what about being an entrepreneur? What, what is it that I think that you should be doing today as an entrepreneur? What I think you should be doing is looking around the room because this is your network. These are the people, the people in this room over the course of your lifetimes will know the answers to almost every question you will ever have. These are the people you're going to be closest to. And so I would look around. I would get to know everybody. I would cruise the, ha cruise, the ha cruise the halls of the engineering school. I would get to know some engineers. I would get to know, why are you laughing at that? You don't know any engineers? Um, I, would, uh, I, would, I, would, I would spend this valuable four years you have at this school to get to know these people. Because like I said, the answers you want are in this room. Um, I always tell uh, the, young pe the, the, the young folks that are trying to start companies that fortune favors the connected entrepreneur. And that is totally true, that fortune favors the connected entrepreneur. Anything you can do to get connected to somebody else will help you. It will help you get funding. It will help you get partnerships. It will help you get customers. It will help you get employees. It's, there's nothing you can do that is more important today than getting connected. The other thing you can do, um, the DC ecosystem. So everybody know what 1776 is? Yeah, I got a couple of nods, yeah. Go down to 1776. I don't exactly know how far it is from here since I always drive here, but um, it's in D.C., so it can't be far. Um, go down there. Talk to the people who are starting companies. Get involved in all the programs they do down there. I mean, there are, it's, it's, it's another ecosystem. Obviously, you've got lots of stuff to do here, but it's just one more that's not related to this. So go out, find out. Ask them what they're doing. Um, don't be afraid to ask people how they got there. I'm always amazed at when I talk to people who work in companies. Oh, who owns the company? Oh, I don't know. Well, why not? Why not you Who's the CEO? Who's, who's in charge? Don't be afraid to ask, because that's the only way you're going to figure it out, and that's the only way you're going to learn from these people and glean information. Go out and ask these people how they got where they are. Um, the other thing is, it's very lonely to start a company. So the more people you have surrounding you who can help you in one way or another, the better off you're going to be. The biggest mistake I made when I started my company was I was in an isolated, I was really an isolated town. We moved there. I didn't have that base, so in retrospect, that may have not been the smartest idea. Um, and I really was, it took, me, it took me years to really network into a community um, and, and to do that. And so I, I really, you really, you really do need to network and get out and find these people. Um, just one more. Uh, one pitch that I use with True is that we have spent a tremendous amount of time um, cultivating what we call a founder platform. It's for anybody who gets plugged into our ecosystem, they're plugged into a valley-based ecosystem. And that uh, is super helpful to people who are not in the valley. It's helpful to people in the valley as well, but people outside the valley, it's really, really helpful too. But if you can find that sort of, um, you know, there's a Facebook page for, uh, for the DC uh, tech community. It's a quite an active Facebook page. Just get on it. Watch what's going on if you want to start a company. Watch what's going on on the Facebook page. People are always offering for help. People are always offering things that, that you're going to need. And it makes you aware. Um, always hire smarter than you are. For me, that wasn't tough. But for you folks, it may be harder. But hire smarter, right? Hire people who are smarter than you are. Surround yourself with principled excellence. People who have the same principles as you do and who are smarter, right? Don't, don't hire below you. That is a crucial, crucial mistake. Smarter people always hire people than they are, smarter than they are. And finally, one of the great resources that you should look at um, is, I don't know if you know it, Steve Blank. So Steve Blank, Steve Blank. Steve Blank did, I think he did four startups. Uh, the first one was kind of a middling startup. The next two, he said, uh, left craters so big in the ground they had their own iridium layer. Um, he lost so much money for his venture capitalists. But the fourth one was a big one. The fourth one was Epiphany, which was a bubble one. Is that ringing a bell to anybody? Anyway, so a bubble one, uh, big deal, sold for a couple billion dollars. He was the primary founder of it. Uh, so he did really well on that one. And he has spends today, steveblank.com is his blog. 
um, and he spends today really teaching entrepreneurship and lean lab startups and all that kind of stuff. He's the guy that I, that I did the NSF i -Corps with. He's a fabulous resource. He is, um, uh, he can be a little coarse, don't tweet that, um, but, he is, uh, but he's a great, great resource for it all. Having SteveBlank.com is, is, uh, is, is his website, which has all kinds of startup stuff on it, so you've got to take a look at that. The other thing that, that uh, helps is perseverance. So how much time am I? Am I running out of time here? I don't want to. Okay, I'm running out of time. Okay, um, perseverance. So Fahad, Has Fahad Hassan is another guy that we invested in. He's a local guy, has an ed tech company. Um, I met Fahad when he was a senior at Virginia Tech. He was presented to me as the brightest, and, uh, brightest programmer at Virginia Tech. I thought, great, I'll meet him. I hated him. I absolutely hated him. Um, you can tweet that because he knows I say that. Um, he, uh, he was the most arrogant kid I'd ever met in my life. Um, so I told him his job, his, he presented his business plan, it was terrible. I said, ah, this is never going to work, You're not, it's not going to work for these reasons. He's like, okay, okay, okay. And, uh, and I went back to the lawyer a couple days later and I, he said, how'd it go? And I said, well, I don't know, I don't think it went very well, I don't think I'm going to get a Christmas card from him. He said, no, no, he actually really liked you. And so Fahan stayed in touch with me for seven years. He would call me when he had a question. Uh, now he says I'm the only guy who returned his email, so maybe that's why. But, uh, but he, would, he would stay in touch, he'd call me, he'd have questions, he ended up raising money, losing money, selling that company uh, to another company and starting another one, and we're now investors in his third company, um, and we've become great friends. And so it is really perseverance. He, he claims it took seven years for him to get to like me, whatever. But, uh, but it really, it did. It took us seven years for us to make this investment. So it, it, perseverance makes a huge difference. So Silicon Valley, everybody asks me the geography question. Can I, do I have to move to California to start a company? The answer is no, but it's easier. Um, and the, the ecosystem here in D.C. is good and getting better, and certain kinds of companies, you, I mean, ed tech is great to start here, and obviously government services are great to start here. If you're going to do a consumer internet company, you're going to do something around that, it's kind of, it's, it's easier to do it, uh, it's easier to do it in Silicon Valley. It's like marrying somebody of a different religion. It certainly, you can certainly do it, it's just easier if you're the same religion, right? It's easier to do it in Silicon Valley. Um, there's also, a, there's also a, a culture of failure in Silicon Valley. And I say culture of failure, we go, huh? culture of failure. A badge of courage, of, of failing, is, is prominent in Silicon Valley. It's almost as though you can't be successful without failing at least once. And so, and, and there are lots of cultures around the world where that is not true at all. In the United States, we accept failure. But in Silicon Valley, it's embraced. It really is embraced in Silicon Valley. And, and so, we always say that, you know, no business plan Ever, see, ever meet successfully with a customer without being changed. And that's true. Every business plan will not survive first contact with a customer, right? So it's that failure, it's that change. Today we call it a pivot, um, but still it's a failure. You're going to do something different. And so, so Silicon Valley really has that in spades. And so there is, so I, I do believe that you can start anywhere. I do think it's easier to do in Silicon Valley. Um, so the unicorn thing, which I've closed. So uh, Eileen at, Cape, at Kleiner Perkins did the unicorn. Um, did anybody look this up, by the way? All right. Uh, so Eileen at KP, Kelly Perkins, did the uh, study of, what, of, the, of the Billion Dollar Unicorn. A Billion Dollar Unicorn really is a company that has been in the last 10 years, funded in the last 10 years, or started in the last 10 years, that today uh, that has a public or private valuation of over a billion dollars. There are only 39 of them. Um, all the apps you use in your phone primarily, the Twitter, those kinds of things, obviously are those companies. But that's what a unicorn is. And my point in this is don't go searching for that. Right? Don't go looking for the unicorn because you probably won't find it. You probably won't find it. We fund, we have 180 companies in our portfolio. Uh, we have um, one, one unicorn in ours, uh, which is actually a pretty good success rate. Um, but but of, the, of the thousands of business plans and of, of ideas that are funded, 39 have reached that billion dollar valuation. So don't go searching for the unicorn. Start a company, no matter what it does, something you're passionate about, go ahead and start it. I actually had this theory that, that success to startups is inversely related to the school you went to. Um, that, it, that when you go to a high-powered school, you're less, you're so afraid of failure. So many people have, have coddled you through this environment. Uh, and I went to big public institutions, so I, you guys really are helped out through all this stuff. I mean, we are left to you know, sink over there. But anyway, uh, th you have so much pressure on you when you graduate to do something great that you're afraid to fail. And, and I don't want you to feel that way. You, you, you go ahead and fail because you're going to learn so much from failing that you're going to be far better off the rest of your life. So don't be afraid to fail. Of those 39 unicorns, there are, I think, what did I write this down? There are only 12 that had MBAs in them. Only 12. 
That's because I think MBAs are afraid to fail. I think they spent this time, they think they know everything. I was this way. You're afraid to fail. So don't be afraid to fail. That's my whole point in that. Um, so really, you know, what does it mean? We, 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 you, you, we talk a lot in this school about principal entrepreneurship. And what does that mean? What does that mean to us? It, basically, for me, it sort of means truth, honor, and integrity in everything you do. Whether it's starting a company, whether it's having a phone call, whether it's posting things on Facebook or LinkedIn, it's, it's being that true to your person and, and, and true to your faith in doing that, uh, but, but it's having integrity and honor because people are going to find out. Uh, I can't tell you. So I was in, um, I was in New York uh, helping a venture firm get started, interviewing an anal interviewing, uh, analysts for him. This kid, he, had, he, interviewed, he interviewed 75 people. Uh, he brought four in for me to tie the four finalists to talk to that day. Um, these all had resumes people would die for. These were all the big name schools, all the boarding schools you can imagine, the big Ivy Leagues. These were all resumes you can die for. And this one kid who was his top choice, um, arrogant you could, would, would, you know, there, was a, there wasn't, wasn't a room big enough to hold his ego. But um, he was, uh, he started talking and he had something on his resume and I questioned him on. And it was clearly he lied on this resume. And then it started to all unravel. And the guy who was starting the firm, the actual, the actual GP, went out and, and did a LinkedIn search and talked to somebody. It turns out he was just full of baloney, that he just has a history of doing this. It took about five minutes to figure this out. So it does follow you. So don't, don't do it. Don't do it. Just that principle of entrepreneurship we talk about here is not just words. It really affects the rest of your life. So the other thing is, um, you know, people ask me, well, he actually, the, the venture capitalist, he says, what was the point of your firm? What, did, what was the goal? What did you want to do? And it, obviously, we need to make money to return to our investors. That's, that's really our driver. We have to do that. Um, we don't invest in things that are illegal and all that kind of stuff. That's all obvious. Um, but what we really try and be is we really try and be the confidant of the CEO or the entrepreneur. You know, there are people who are way smarter than us. There are people who are probably much friendlier than us. Um, but we want to be that person he calls at 2 a.m. in the he or she calls at 2 a.m. in the morning to tell you some good news or tell you some bad news because they know they're going to get the truth from us. They know that we're going to tell it to them clearly, and that we're not and, and, and we're just going to work through the problems with them. And that's what you want to be. You you want to be, you that's that's the reputation you want to have because really the reputation is all you've got, and it's all you ever have. Um, talking about reputations, we don't sign non-disclosure agreements. So if you go, if 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 you go and pitch a venture capitalist, I'm happy to talk to anybody about how to do that. If you go and pitch a venture capitalist and you say, "Hey, I'd love you to sign a non-disclosure agreement," which means that you won't tell people about my idea, we won't sign it. We don't sign it for anything. Um, and everybody, some people get offended and walk away, but we don't sign it because we see so many plans. If we sign an NDA, we we would be out of business. That's the practical aspect of it. The, 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 the real aspect is all we have is a reputation. We're, we're not going to do it. We're not going to share that plan with somebody else. And if you're actually that, this is a little bit of a side, but if you're that worried about uh, telling people your idea, that's a bad thing. That's a bad thing. Ideas need air. I need idea, ideas need other people to talk about it. Ideas need to be shown out in the public. And I'm not talking about trade secrets and the formula for Coke. I'm talking about what your product is and, and who you intend to sell it to. Um, that's what needs to get out. And you need to talk to people about that. Um, but again, it comes back to your reputation. So uh, just remember, it is a very small community. LinkedIn and Twitter may f seem great. Facebook may seem great, may be able to reach out to a lot of people. But it's there forever, ever. And we look at it all. Right? And it allows us to just triangulate uh, on people so quickly. And that's why and when people are our only business, we can triangulate on almost anybody within two or three degrees of freedom based on who you are. So it is, so be careful what you put out there. So in conclusion, really, um, I don't care what company you start. Uh, I don't want you to go after the billion dollar unicorn. If you hit one, it's great. Mark, when he started the Facebook, which was originally called, he didn't have any idea what it was, right? It pivoted into what it is today. Mark Pincus, same thing as Zynga. He didn't know that. Tim at Living Social. I passed on Living Social because it was a $5 million Series A for Facebook games. Well, he doesn't do that anymore, right? So we missed out on Living Social, but he pivoted. He changed. And so it, 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 it doesn't matter really where you start. You really have God-given talents. Use them for whatever you're passionate about. Don't worry. Don't chase that billion-dollar uh, unicorn. If somebody talks about a lifestyle company in a derisive way, just walk away. A lifestyle company is what my company was. It was not a company that was going to go public or achieve a billion dollar unicorn valuation, right? But it was a great company to support several families and provide a lifestyle, which I sold and, and changed my life with. So it is, so don't be worried. Don't be worried if, if people, when, 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 uh, when I was taking classes at, in business school, they would talk about, you can't go after a market unless it's a $10 billion market. Don't listen to that. Go after the market you're passionate about. 
uh, just work on something that you think will outlive you and outlive your ambition, right? And anything can be that way. But think about it in those terms. That it's not just about you. It's actually about outliving you. Um, and like I said, if you have an idea, talk about it. Give it the air. Prototype it. Find somebody in the engineering department, computer science, to do a, to, to do a prototype, a beta product for you. And just do it. Just get out there and do it. Don't, don't wait until it's perfect. Because truly, perfection is the enemy of good enough. And it is. That is totally, that's completely true. So get out and do it. That's really all I have to say. <clears throat>